and get going here. Just uh, this, if you've seen uh, what appeared on your screen, it's a, just a notification that we record these meetings. Uh, welcome to this overview of our SCEP program for the city of Los Angeles. My name is Senior Inspector James McDevitt. Um, I'm currently assigned to the North Regional Office. And I supervise uh, the complaint section here at this office, uh, which covers about roughly parts of in whole or part of about six different CDs, council districts, basically the, the valley plus Sunland Tahunga. Um, my work experiences, I've worked for building and safety as an inspector early in my career as well as coming to housing and working as a SCEP inspector, um, a case manager um, in the tenant habitability unit, um, as well as uh, performing outreach throughout the city at sometimes what they call uh, the Congress events where community groups like the neighborhood councils get together on a Saturday. And a lot of city agencies uh, have booths and things set up and, and give talks there. Um, I've also uh, supervised our special enforcement unit uh, where we have some unusual cases that might range from an illegal hostel as an example, as well as um, hoarding conditions. But basically the focus of today's uh, webinar is gonna be to kind of give you a brief overview of how code enforcement works, both from a proactive level and from a reactive level. So we'll talk about our systematic code enforcement program and what that entails. Um, hopefully in our audience today, if, we, if you're an owner, you'll be able to take something away from this that'll help you manage your property uh, with your property managers. And if you're a tenant, maybe you'll understand some of the codes and some of the things we look for so that you know, you're aware of where you live and what it's supposed to be like and maybe what you're not supposed to do as well as, as that. Okay. So um, we represent the city of Los Angeles. Um, we formerly were called the Housing and Community Investment Department and we had a name change recently. We're still waiting for some from brochures and literature to have the new logo, but we now go through uh, as the Los Angeles Housing Department. Um, our city is growing more and more uh, as, as, as time goes on. And we have about 3.9 million people that we serve based on the last 2020 census. And about 60% of those are renters. So our primary focus is inspecting where there's two or more units that uh, are at least one of which is being rented. And that encompasses about 850,000 units in the city of Los Angeles. Now, our, our background is, is that um, like a lot of things in the city that are developed, it's only when there is a problem do, do the elected representatives and the community members come together to try and tackle that problem. And our problem uh, early, about 22 years ago, was that our most affordable housing wasn't being maintained. In other words, it was important to protect the, the, uh, the older housing stock pre-1978, especially because it had some benefits of being rent stabilized. And that, that was a benefit to the community. But at the same time, they needed some type of, of systematic system that would ensure that those properties are maintained. So the city government got together along with uh, community representative, community leaders, and formed the Blue Ribbon Rental Housing Committee to address the dilapidation. Um, at that time, our first um, icon appeared. This is a logo that if you've been around the city for a number of years, you saw uh, probably for 10 or 15 years, that LAHD. Um, then we became the Los Angeles Housing and Community Investment Department. And now we've returned back to Los Angeles with a slightly different logo. So we'll talk about first the, the scope of work of what our duties are and where our jurisdiction lies. So our scope is rental properties, like I said, that have two or more legal dwelling units. And um, in order to pay for this, the Blue Ribbon Committee established that fees should be billed. And these SCEP fees cover the first two inspections. So 
the billing part of this is uh, the fees and then those fees allow for two inspections at the property and so our inspection process is is first um, we mail an inspection notice to the pro property owner and then we post the tenant inspection notice on the site each individual unit um, uh, we inspect uh, all the apartments all the common areas and the exterior and at that scheduled inspection if we find violations that are that exist um, we go ahead and conduct a, we issue a notice to comply uh, with a time limit of and a date of when we'll be out there for the reinspection then we conduct a reinspection and if the violations are corrected we close the case if not all the violations are corrected then we may be able to grant an extension of time um, or if um, you know some of the violations are corrected but not enough to justify substantial compliance we'll refer that case to a hearing we have so that what I just described to you just a moment ago is our proactive. We're out at the property due to mandate in the in the city municipal code that requires us by a certain time to do proactive inspection where we look for violations. We have another type of complex um, inspection process that is reactive, and that's our complaint inspection process. Now, uh, complaints first of all can be filed by anyone. They can be filed online, by phone, in person, um, and complainants are do remain anonymous, but but they and they don't have to live at the property. But when we say anonymous, we mean that we collect who is a complainant, their phone number, and we set a time and a date to inspect, and that we don't release that information out to the public or to anybody else. So that's what we mean by anonymous. That should anybody approach us, we don't say the name and phone number of the complainant of record. And they don't have to live live uh, at the property. I like to tell this story oh, about 10 years ago or more than 10 years ago. If you live in the valley, uh, there's a street called Riverside. And on Riverside, there was a older building. It was built in the 1940s. And the front facing part of it had a large balcony and it had these rails. And these rails were probably six inches in diameter apart. And somebody had been here uh, to watched the Rose Bowl football game. And unfortunately, they had experienced a tragedy in their life uh, from, I think they came from Missouri, where one of their grandkids had fallen off and, and passed away because they, they slipped in the slots of, of the balcony. And they made a complaint, you know, you know, saying it was an urgent situation that somebody might die if we didn't get out there. Well, two things to tell with this story. They were from uh, Missouri. And they didn't live here and they made that complaint just by driving by and having this emotional personal connection. The other thing is, is when we researched that case, we found out that that particular balcony was being maintained and uh, that rail was being maintained in the original approved condition from the date, I, uh, I say 1940, but it could have even been earlier. And it, it, it had original approved rights. In other words, it could be maintained in, in, in a condition that was inconsistent with today's codes, but consistent with them. They were called non-conforming rights. Some people like to refer to that as grandfather rights, but that's a different story. Um, grandfather rights only apply simply to um, if your grandfather built something and permitted it back when he built it. Not, it's not based on how long something was there. It's, did it have the original approvals at the time it came into effect? So that's just a brief little background anecdotal story about complaints. So the complaint inspection process for us is simply this. Um, we generally make contact with our complainants within 72 hours, okay? Um, we're gonna respond within 72 hours. Sometimes we'll re even respond to be at the site right away, but usually we're gonna try in most uh, circumstances be out there within seven days, unless circumstances dictate otherwise. Like if we don't get out there, it could have been, you know, uh, a truck hit the side of a building and we have to respond on an emergency basis and find out, you know, do we need to vacate this building or, or not? You know, can people live there? There's a whole process we go through in those urgent complaint inspections. Another example is the lack of hot water. So if we come out there, we issue a notice to an order to comply if the violations are found. 
we conduct a, a complaint reinspection. Then we can conduct a second reinspection and we close a case or grant an extension if we have substantial compliance. Or if we don't have substantial compliance, we refer the case for a general manager's hearing. So general manager's hearing. Whenever violations remain after the compliance date, uh, the general manager shall conduct a hearing per, per our municipal code. And at this hearing, the hearing officer may determine whether or not to refer the case to the city attorney's office for a criminal prosecution and whether or not the case should be referred into our rent escrow accounts program. So some of our other enforcement uh, orders uh, that we have, some tools that we have available to us that we just briefly touched on is these emergency type orders where we come out right away. So sometimes we might come out right away and find somebody doing work that is without the benefit of a permit. And the classic example is the re-roofer the person who goes out there, the owner says, hey, we had a lot of leaks last winter. He hires a contractor, a contractor doesn't tell him he needs a permit. And we come out there and they start tearing off, off the roof. Well, we're going to come out there. We're going to tell them to stop the work, but also maintain the weather protection. You know, so they might have to tarp it up and go down and get your permit. So that'd be an example of it. Um, so these stop work orders are orders that cease the ceasing of construction work, which uh, requires a permit when a permit has not been issued. Or we can also issue a stop work order for lead safe practices that aren't being used. Um, so violators of these, of these orders can be individually cited and fined in some circumstances, um, but in other circumstances, in most cases, it goes straight to ownership. Now we have another type of order that we will issue in, in um, concert with a notice to comply. And this other type of order is called the occupant notice in order to comply. We'll issue this classically for when we're doing a SCEP inspection and we come into a unit and there's hoarding conditions. We'll issue that occupant notice in order to the individual who's on the lease, who's responsible for the tenant sanitation issues, but we'll issue it to, to ownership as well on the notice to comply. Now, why do we issue it to an, an owner? to the notice and not just to the occupant because the owner has a bigger global responsibility to keep all their tenants safe. So that because of that sanitation hoarding issue, the tenants surrounding that property are in, in danger should there be a fire, not just the individual who lives there. And so the owner needs to be um, active in exercising their rights to address this situation. Here's an example uh, that we'll see, you know, of, of a horrible hoarding situation. Um, you know, very dense, packed personal property, floor to ceiling. Okay, moving on to other enforcement tools. We, we talked about it briefly at the beginning of the PowerPoint here. This is uh, our two day order to repair. This is where we have certain things that when they take place, we say they're an imminent hazard. And we want the, the correction uh, or the abatement of this hazard to begin within 48 hours or be even be completed in a timely manner uh, because it's such a hazard. So some of the things could be like a big sewage backup that's flooded underneath the building and it's just filled with defecation, liquid defecation. Or it could be uh, a whole building that has no hot water or a building that has uh, no water at all. Um, in the winter times, uh, it could be just simply um, a lack of an operable heater to maintain the required heating. So these would be the grounds that we use for a two day order. Um, some of the examples of some of the citations that we have that in involve fire life safety um, are the fire separation in a mechanical room like you see right here with the opening of in the wall there. Also, just as a kind of a, a purview or preview of, of some of the other things we'll, we'll see and talk about is the water heater that is not presenting as if it's been approved and is installed in approved condition. There's no seismic straps on that. And just from the looks of it, I don't even see a TNP line and that vent line looks like it's going off into space. 
Other tools, extreme tools that we have, I think I mentioned that scenario where a truck or a fire might um, have damaged a building. Sometimes the calamitous event is so severe that we're required to order what we call a vacation. Uh, that means where everyone has to move out. Um, and sometimes it's an immediate vacation, uh, a lack of an emergency egress, a lack of fire warning devices or structural failure um, or fire damage, um, or uh, you know, if there's a police chase and a car rammed into a building and took out a whole side wall that was an important structural element into the building. And the people who lived around that may not um, be able to continue living there until those repairs are made. Uh, in some cases, the department makes a judgment that relocation benefits may be paid by the department uh, within fees put, imposed by the property owner. Um, that's a brief overview, overview of that, um, but in regards to how that determination is made, that would be something that would be addressed in a different talk uh, with uh, a rent staff. So unapproved units. Sometimes um, due to our housing shortage, things are, are, are taken up that are just um, you know, out of desperation. People will move in areas. And this is a photo of where we uh, did an inspection and we found somebody living in, in what they called unit 13, but it really was a janitorial closet. And it was packed with household items. There was a little ladder and then at the very top, it looked like they had some kind of makeshift living area. From the looks of this, it looks like maybe this had some type of plumbing for a bathroom based on that window. And then somebody could lay up there and, and uh, you know, just trying to convert it to a habitable area. So if you're an owner, uh, what, are you, what are you getting into? Okay, what do you, you want to know what we're looking for when we come out on our inspections. You also want to know how to conduct repairs. And you want to basically all of this is to get you prepared for what what could happen. So we're going to talk about a few training topics here. We're going to talk about researching and interpreting permits, some basic code violations that are common to the work that we do, and some some practices for conducting repairs. So first, first off is when you do need a permit and you almost need a permit, they're, they're, they call them exceptions um, when you don't need a permit because there's not many circumstances where you don't need a permit. So the code lays out what, what you need in, in pretty certain terms. Um, if it's regulated in the building code and it's over $500, it needs a permit. Okay, that's just for the building code. The electrical and the plumbing codes have very specific requirements for permits and then they have in their administration section of those codes they tell you except for and they have a very limited amount of exceptions so hiring the person best to know when you need a permit is important also you can contact building and safety um, at the same time where you would obtain your permit you can ask questions about if a permit is required but make sure you don't ask a question without all the details if you, you know, bring a photo of what the work is that you're going to do and just at point blank ask them if you need a permit or not, or call us and we can, we can guide you to, to some degree. Um, so you have two locations, 201 North Figueroa um, and then 6262 Van Nuys. Um, also, if you want to check for permits, you have online activity reports called property activity report. You can check. It's very easy to do. And then for older permits, these are all open to public review and anybody can do it. Most inspectors, when we come out and the tenant has said that they've, there's unapproved work, you know, there's a good percentage of the time that we go into these systems and we say, no, sir, we found the permit and here, here it is. You know, because sometimes the complainant who's making the complaint doesn't know this information, how to check for permits, and they just have a feeling about it. Also, in a, assisting us in finding hard to find permits and certificates of occupancy, we do have access to the county assessor records that go back 50, 60, 70 years. So we can usually get uh, trace the life of a building from its point of conception um, and, and being built 
to where it is today. And we can see that progression through the years. And oftentimes on those county records, they may give us a little breadcrumb trail where we could find a missing permit for somebody uh, just because it's been misfiled. So how do you determine what's been approved? Well, you have to review the original building permit and any, any subsequent permits, and if any plans are available. Uh, only original permits and related alteration permits determine what's been approved. Again, this kind of speaks to the idea like, how could it not be approved? It's been here for 50 years. Believe it or not, with the topography of the city of LA, as well as the size of the city of LA, and our program has only been here for about 22 years where we're proactively looking for violations. There are occasions where we do come across um, significant structures that were built without permits or structures that have been converted illegally that when we get down to it, we find out there were chicken houses and things of that nature because of the area in the valley that had a lot of farming and agriculture going on. Um, now for change of use permits, um, they, when you review those, they should show what's being changed. Um, unrelated permits, if you have a garage that was turned into a legal dwelling unit and you show us a permit for uh, that's finalized for recess lighting, that's not gonna address the use issue on that. It may justify that this garage can have recess lighting, but it doesn't change the use. Only permits with final approval are, are valid. So we have a pretty good history compared to other large cities in the United States as far as being able to go back in time. Um, my, my earliest research that I did as an assistant inspector, uh, I found the permit from 1905, uh, and I believe it was for Brooklyn Avenue, which is now Cesar Chavez Boulevard. And so we do have a, a great library that you can do your own research. Now, this is an example of what's called a number two permit from 1914. And this is a permit for a garage. And it says right up there by number one, the use of the building, the address, the permit number, and the building description of how it's gonna be. Typically 20 by 20 or at the highest point at the peak is 14 feet. And this is the approval. A number two per permit in this era uh, is counts as a permit and a C of all together. Now, around 1948, I would say, um, they changed uh, permits to have two components. You would get a, a number one permit, which is the initial permit, and then you would get a certificate of occupancy, which was supplementing. And the certificate of occupancy was the way the building department said, okay, that goal of building that garage, that number one permit, it's now completed, it's now official, and here's the certificate of occupancy, and it, it, it finalizes it, okay? So when you get to a certain error in time where they discontinued using these number two permits, you're gonna need a number one permit and a certificate of occupancy. Now, a number, moving up into modern times, a number three permit is, is an alteration permit. It means there's a current use of a building and they wanna do an alteration. Now, sometimes the alteration can result in a new CFO having to be generated, okay? And then sometimes it might not. It could be a simple number three permit to repair some termite damage on a garage and not result in a new CFO. Or it could be a number three permit where you're changing, you're going to convert a garage to, sco uh, to, score, to storage and a new car carport and rec room. And you're changing, when, when do you need a new CFO? Well, they'll usually let you know, but it's when you add a footprint, you make it bigger or you change the use. Those are usually the two components that require a CFO. So in this case, this is a number, a three permit, alteration permit to convert to uh, a change of use. If, you, if, if we had cited this um, garage because there was a citation until the CFO that would have been associated with this is shown to us, it hasn't been legally converted to, to what they're gonna, the new use is gonna be 
um, a garage, looks like a carport and a little more detail. And this is obviously a result of this permit was a result of something that building and safety cited on September 22nd, 1987. See, it's, this is to let the, the new construction staff know that there's an existing order on this. And this is this customer's way of complying. So code violations. So on our proactive inspections, what are we looking for? Um, and what codes do we apply? We basically we apply the maintenance part of the code. You know, we're going to look at that the building is being maintained in its original proof condition, and that if any alterations or any additions or any new electricals add, they have the proper permits for those. And our our span of codes that we use include building, plumbing, electrical, mechanical, fire, life, safety, etc., including zoning codes. Uh, we do cite for zoning violations. Um, we talked about. Uh, the existing non-conforming rights, I, I kind of said it gets confused with the, this thing called grandfathering in, you know. So basically, uh, if your grandfather uh, built something and he got a permit and it's approved, then your grandfather has existing non-conforming rights. If your grandfather built something in Sutherland, Tahanga, and never told anybody about it and never got a permit, he doesn't, and it's been there for 30 or 40 years, it doesn't have non-conforming existing rights. It's just simply something that was built without the required permits. Fire life safety, that's one of the things that we focus on tremendously in our department. When we do our SCEP inspections, we're gonna focus on those smoke detectors and make sure they're in the sleeping rooms and the rooms outside of the sleeping rooms or the carbon monoxide detectors, in the vicinity of sleeping rooms. We're gonna look at these uh, security bars, these approved quick release mechanism, make sure they work as they're designed. Um, on the exit doors, we don't wanna see any double key locks. Um, you know, I understand that you may have a key hanging right up there on the wall, but if somebody is, uh, if it's a smoke filled apartment and they're trying to get out, they might knock the key, not see it, not know where it was, and then they dive a smoke inhalation. So that's one of the reasons for the, the code on the double key locks. If you have a large uh, control panel with a, a big fire alarm system in your building, it needs to be in the green so that it's not in the trouble situation. These are oftentimes buildings with automatic doors, fire sprinkler systems and things of that nature. And there's a big control panel. So that control panel will blink red when usually when there's uh, some kind of um, defect in it. Um, oftentimes we'll come to apartments and we see smoke detectors. These smoke detectors are the easiest violation to correct. Um, I, when I was doing SCEP inspections on my reinspections, I used to, if I pulled up for the reinspection and they had a maintenance guy with a manager there and then they had a little cart just in case there was a problem with smoke detectors, I always felt like Wow, I got a, I've got a, um, an ownership group here and a team here that really cares about correcting these violations and making everyone safe. Um, this is typically, you know, a type of violation that we'll cite for. We were talking about the quick release. You know, it could be a stirrup that you push in or a little handle that'll pop these out so you can get out in case of fire. The example, the double key lock we were talking about. So our, our plumbing violations, most commonly cited plumbing violations are defective leaking fixtures. Um, you know, sometimes if you're an owner, you might not hear about this right away because your tenant is so busy. And in a lot of cases, the water is paid for by the owner. So we do catch a lot of these on our, our SCEP inspections of leaking and defective fixtures. We check for the uh, plumbing uh, connections and caulking in particular that they're properly sealed from water intrusion that you know add to the life of, of the building in that area. Plumbing fixtures, surfaces, sinks, and laboratories and tubs and showers should be glazed as necessary to prevent damage. Again, you know, the goal of our is to extend the life of our most affordable housing. Um, and every day we get older and older, and buildings that were considered young 10 years ago are now starting to show their age. Block drains, they should operate as designed and flow freely. Loose fixtures, loose faucets, 
lavatories uh, uh, and toilets are, are common. Some inspectors like to kind of, when they're doing their skep and they have their F5 with them, they might lean into just really lightly into the toilet and find out it's really wobbly or it'll be brought to their attention. I'm always surprised when I'm when our staff is out at a complaint and this toilet is 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 got like four inches of movement on every side. Talked about the water heater straps and the importance of of having the proper strapping one third up one third down uh, to secure it from displacement during an earthquake. Water heater uh, temperature and pressure valve extensions that's a drain line. Um, you may have uh, seen on Mythbusters. Uh, I always used to use this, you know, the importance of having the TMP line and 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 that pressure relief there, uh, you know, in case the, the it can really be like a missile. And Mythbusters proved that on one of their episodes, they took off the TMP line and just heat heat um, added heat to the water heater until it exploded. And it didn't explode. They had built a little shed around it, and it, it probably went 150 feet in the air and just right through the roof. So, you know, that's an important safety feature because of the damage and that if they do uh, overheat and explode. Unapproved uh, plumbing. Um, you know, water heaters require a permit. And once you get the permit, that's your authorization to do the work. And then the permit is the, the fees that you pay for an inspector from building and safety to check your work. And um, water heater replacement is, is commonly a source of complaints of tenants who happen to be knowledgeable of the code or they've taken one of these seminars and they realize that, hey, they just last summer, they put that water heater without a permit. And then we end up citing it. Um, you know, this is an example of just a little bit of water, but you know, most times the owner's paying for that. And this is something, in addition to our proactive program where we come out every four or two years, depending on the last uh, SCAP and how successful that SCAP was, um, you know, we're gonna cast these, but it's a good idea as an owner to have a calendar and, and, and pencil in when you're just gonna look in your, your units, not just because a SCAP is coming up, just to maintain and see uh, what's going on in that unit. Do you have any cost savings that you could find by replacing fixtures that are leaking? Again, I was talking about the Mythbusters before. On the right-hand side of this photo, you see the T&P. And again, if that's not functioning correctly and it's getting heat, it can really explode. So we talk about electricals now. Most commonly cited electrical violations um, it is a GFI when near water source a possible wet location uh, is replaced. When you replace what was originally there, the code uh, most often will require you to upgrade to whatever the current code. That's what we call a proactive ordinance. And in that case, you can't just replace like with like. You have to upgrade. Countertops is probably be the good best example on it. Maybe you maybe the building was built in 1962 and the receptacles on the countertop didn't require that. Now, they added into the electrical code that took away the non-conforming rights and required the upgrade of those outlets when they die, when they become defective, that when they're being replaced, they now get moved to GFI, GFCI. Other basic things are just simply cover plates that are missing. That's a good thing to, to watch for in your regular inspections especially if your apartment has young kids in it where they could stick stuff in there and maybe get a shock. Exposed wiring should be concealed in an approved uh, conduit or, or, and or junction boxes. And light fixtures should be working as they're designed, free from defects. And the whole light fixture includes the globe. You know, that's all part of that component. So that's something to be aware of. Defective uh, receptacles should be in proper working order. Unapproved electrical wiring and uh, electrical upgrades we, we see. Somebody has a hot bedroom, they'll put a zip cord in and then mount a ceiling fan in lieu of the globe, the globe light fixture. So, you know, it's, you know, it's, if you want a ceiling fan, you need to get, it's called a paddle fan, you need to get a, a permit for it. It requires a special attachment above it due to the weight of it. So you can't just switch out 
a light fix, uh, uh, yeah, a light fixture in a bedroom with a ceiling fan and say, okay, we're good to go. You need to get a permit for that because there is something that usually happens when this is done. And I think I have a photo down the line here of it. Some of the faulty electrical violations we cite is this conduit to the garbage disposal as an example. Uh, this is that zip cord I'm talking about to you before you see go in there. And a lot of times you can imagine seeing a smoke detector within the length of the fan blade there. And then we've got an issue with the smoke detector and we've got this unapproved paddle fan there as you know, and then of course the conductors that are completely rigged up in, in a legal way. So some of the most common uh, cited maintenance violations are walls and ceiling. Hey, your walls need to not have any peeling paint. They should, they should be in good condition. Ceilings and the paint should be free from defects. Windows and doors, they need to operate as their design. You shouldn't have to have a sliding door that you have to apply upward pressure lean in slightly and then with your right hand jiggle the knob so that it slides and open that's an indication that if you have to do that many things it's not working as it's designed uh, floor covering should be intact and free from tripping hazards uh, premises including trash and debris and overgrown lawns need to be maintained they can you can especially with those shrubberies that are by driveways they can get so high that now they impair the visibility triangle for a driver coming out and you run the risk of a driver hitting somebody on the sidewalk. Counter and drain board top should be intact and impermeable. Uh, stair deck surfaces should be maintained. Example of a flooring violation. And um, uh this is in a bathroom maybe there was a repair uh, sometimes they repair the leak and the owner forgets to come back and finish up the repair typically what we cite weather protection most commonly cited weather protection violations are exterior paint so all of these this proactive looking that we do in the skep inspection program is again primarily to, to maintain our most affordable housing stock and so if you can tackle the inside, you wanna tackle the outside. And because sometimes the penetrations, if you don't have proper weather protection, you're gonna get water infiltration inside to the wall cavities. And then you can have other things that can cause harm to the tenants. And it's best to, to pay attention to the outside of the building. So there shouldn't be any peeling paint. Um, and if there is, you know, get on it right away. Make sure you find out uh, if you haven't known about it, you know, trace it and find out what possible damage could it have caused that you may not be able to see. Uh, window door glass should be intact and free from cracks. Exterior openings in um, stucco or, or the siding could be a source of water damage. And roof leaks could cause great damage if left unintended and even cause harm. Example of our peeling paint. So conducting repairs, learn what repairs need to be done. So what's the best way to learn what you need to do on your skip? First, show up, be there, meet your inspector at the property, have someone meeting you. It doesn't have to be you. If you're out of town on a vacation, this is not convenient for you, then have a cousin. Anybody who can read and write and take a notepad to get you started and knowing what your notice to comply is gonna be. And to be proactive, we talked about that before, put on your calendar that you're gonna go into your units, just a kind of a brief overview, let your tenants know that you're maintaining the, the, the apartment, you're not looking for issues, but you wanna address issues that you're responsible for. And um, when you're with an inspector, be, ask those questions of what's expected of you, uh, ask questions about your violations when you get your notice to comply. If the inspector cannot, answer those questions, you can contact a senior inspector. Most times we're able to help people. I know with my complaint inspectors, we take um, photographs at our initial inspections with our complainants. So I will just get a phone call and, and an owner will be dumbfounded that they have anything wrong with their building. And they'll say, you know, I never heard about this. I didn't know about this. And then I send them the photos and they're very thankful for it because 
photos speak a thousand words. Now, hire qualified workers. You know, if you're getting one recommendation, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm an old school believer in three references. Check the quality of the work um, before you move forward with it. Um, it's important to, to, to have qualified people because they can create problems if the work is not done correctly. Uh, licensed contractors. A licensed contractor is usually required when obtaining a permit. Uh, and so that's something that you should be aware of, especially if the person that you want to hire for the job, if you've been cited for a water heater violation that was done without the required permits and approvals from building and safety and the person you're hiring doesn't have a license, they, they can't, I don't know how they could promise you that they're going to get uh, a permit unless there's an exception and maybe it's like two single families on 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 a lot maybe there's an exception you could do it but most of the the stock that we have is multifamily, where it's one building with two three four 52 110 units and you're going to need a contractor in most cases whenever you um, need a permit there's a website, it's easy to check for the contractors to see, make sure their insurance is uh, at the contractor's state license the board of California. You can check, uh, check their license and see if there's been any complaints. That back, back end work that you do before you start the work is gonna pay off dividends in getting the work done correctly and passing your inspection. So some of the benefits of inspections for owners. First of all, um, Whenever you have been cited for work that doesn't have a permit, if something were to be happening, you could be found liable for it for your insurance company. You could have an issue with them not being willing to indemnify you if you've been aware of this issue for a while. Um, also, um, you know, through inspections, inspectors will identify code violations which should be repaired if left unattended. These violations could cause somebody to become injured and then you have a personal injury claim on, on your hands. The other benefit to owners is, is that a, a well-looking building will uh, increase in value. It'll keep the property value even up in troubled times in comparison to other neglected buildings. And the last thing is what we call the broken window theory. If your building presents as well-maintained that there's a set of eyes that are looking at this building or there's some attention to the normal maintenance and things don't go on long, too long. When there's, you know, there's no graffiti on it, there's no broken windows. That building is less likely to, to be the target for vandals. Vandals have a tendency to break into buildings that, that, that present as unmaintained and uh, also um, squatters too in vacant units. So here's some changes that you might not be aware of. Um, um, we recently uh, changed in 2018 to add this to our scope. We now have the authority to administer and enforce the provisions of the article of the State Housing Code. And this is the section that it encompasses. And one example of this change resulted us in us having jurisdiction over what's called the caretaker code. The caretaker code says a manager, janitor, or housekeeper or other responsible party shall reside upon the premises and shall have charge of every apartment house in which there are 16 or more apartments and of every hotel in which there are 12 or more guest rooms in the event that the owner of an apartment house or hotel does not reside upon said premises only one caretaker would be required for all structures under one ownership and on one continuous parcel of land. What that means is, is that if there's two 16 unit apartment houses that are touching each other contiguously, then it's, it's okay if they only had one caretaker for each that, that could take care of it. Conceivably that person could take care of both, okay? But when there's 16 or more units, you need to have a resident caretaker, okay? Um, if, if the owner doesn't reside or your caretaker doesn't reside on the premises of any apartment house where there are more than four but less than 16, a notice stating the owner's name and address or the name and address of the owner's agent in charge of it shall be posted in a conspicuous place on the property. So that's the part two of that.
So I find right now that we have many apartment houses in the city of LA, or 16 units or more, where the ownership is not aware of this, this caretaker law. So um, here's my contact information. Um, my name is uh, Senior Inspector James McDavid. Um, um, I would appreciate a phone call if you have any questions or an email. Maybe you want to talk to me confidentially, you know, in a, at a different time. That That's fine. But right now, I want to open it up and see if we have any uh, questions right now. And I'll take a look at the, uh, the chat here. the chat here we go i have a question can you please share your contact information again sure it's um i'll just say it um it's uh james j-a-m-e-s dot m as in mary c as in cat d as in david e as in edward v as in victor i-t-t at la city dot org and my phone number is 818 756-1453. Um, if you didn't get it, if, if you think it'd be better to put the slide back, I can do that, but I'll, I'll look at the chat. Yeah, so this, I'll go to the next one. If a tenant is under um, a UD and do not allow owner to perform work to comply, what can we do as owners? I'll answer this question. Um, first of all, is, is, is if a UD is uh, one of the steps of eviction. And if you have any eviction paperwork, you contact that, uh, the inspector who cited you and you contact his supervisor and you give him that eviction paperwork and start a communication with them about what, where you are in the enforcement status and, and where you expect to be in the um the civil process and then that senior will make a decision of maybe consulting with the principal inspector and and uh, in some cases what i've done in that case is where a tenant an owner's properly posted it i'll do a three-way call between the owner and the tenant and just say you know we have a saying in complaints don't order the food if you're not going to take delivery so if you make a complaint and we cite the violation um, and the owner is doing their diligence to um, address that, you need to allow legal access. So, you know, we start to document that, uh, um, the difficulties we have there. How far do Sealy fans need to be from fire sprinklers or smoke detectors? Okay, if you're asking that question, it sounds like you may have a ceiling fan that was installed without the permits. Um, off the top of my head, I think it's about 36 inches. But that's but your if your building wasn't designed with that if your building was designed with a ceiling fan and a smoke detector and it's away and it hasn't changed from the original approval, it's going to be fine. But if it's too close, chances are that ceiling fan was added without the required permit. Now, those. Um, websites that we have for property activity report go back to 2002. So you can go back in time and see if your ceiling fan was approved in that location. But it's about 36 inches. Uh, when can the SCAP fee be charged to residents? Okay, so that question is um, related to a rent question. It wouldn't be a code enforcement. So I would refer you to our rent division, um, you can ask to speak to the rent uh, investigator, someone in billing, perhaps, at, and the phone number there is 1-866-557-7368. Does your office notify owners through mail or do they email owners? It's done through mail. We'll use email as a tool, as an extra tool to outreach, but um, the, uh, the code requires us at the last, um, at the county records last tax record address to notify owners through that, through that address. 
what should you do if one of your units is listed as a two bedroom, one bath on Zemus, but has two baths? Uh, written into that question is an assumption that, well, Zemus is not, um, doesn't have any approvals with it. It's a, it's a zoning information map system that extracts, I believe, some of its data from county records. And so Zemus doesn't carry any approvals. What carries approval is the building and safety records. So um, I guess you could make a complaint and we could pull the permits on that and we could look at it and see if the you know building is being maintained as it was originally approved. But the fact that that um, if Zima says two bedrooms and one bath, and then you have two bedrooms and two baths, it doesn't automatically mean that that's not approved because it, building and safety is what where that record would be. Um, so hopefully that answers the question. You could make a complaint in, in that regard. But there would have to be evidence that that particular bath um, was added or some there was been some alteration without the particular uh, violation being cited. And the other thing I should I should mention is that our violations are not like civil violations. They're actually at the fundamental, the basic when it comes down to it, they're criminal violations. If they're not if we if we issue an order and it's not complied with, and it goes and goes and there's still no compliant, we end up going to a jury trial and we seek an eviction for a misdemeanor um, conviction with a thousand dollar fine for up to six months in jail. So with those kind of stakes, we have to be able to prove beyond without a reasonable doubt that that violation exists. And um, we have to gather the evidence ourselves. And so if the evidence that was submitted was just a Zemus report, that wouldn't be sufficient to get a conviction. We have to have really concrete evidence as far as that. And just, just to let you know, I, last year I, we had a, we had a, a one week trial um, where somebody was running an illegal hostel at two different properties. And we went through the whole, the whole process of a, of a trial with a jury. And we got convic convictions on three counts at two different properties. But the, the, the amount of evidence that we got was like this big. And the amount of evidence that ultimately we used in trial was, was smaller. So there has to be a lot of evidence that shows there has to be some smoking gun, so to speak, that would indicate that something was illegal there. Thank you, you're welcome. Uh, how does a landlord proceed if we have a list of violations and the tenants do not provide access for repairs? Okay, great question. I hear it um, three to 400 times a year. And the answer to the question is owners, this is a business and owners need to exercise their, their all their rights, all their legal rights to effect repairs. And effecting a repair, it means that some owners have to pursue an eviction because they're being denied access, then that's what they have to do. They have the right to do that. And if that comes to like a similar question where you couldn't get in to do the repairs, um, you let the department know, the representative, you email them, you know, your three-day performing quit, whatever that is. And um, in some cases, like I myself uh, have a policy, if, if I believe that we can get somewhere, I'll make the three-way phone call and talk to the tenant in whatever unit and explain to them that they need to provide access. You know, once that owner posts that 24-hour notice, they go in there. Now, there's some exceptions to that, like if somebody had COVID or or they're sick in the unit. There are some things that overrule that, but generally speaking, um, you need to have cooperation and you need to have reasonableness. And if you're not, we should, as uh, supervisors, reach out and try and, you know, uh, see if we can mitigate that. But ultimately, it's a business and you have to exercise your rights. So I think that answers that question. Please post it. Uh, I'll go ahead and give my, uh, before I end, we end this particular uh, webinar, I'll put it up back up in, once we get through the questions. So let, I'll just put a reminder.
There's COVID-19 protections related to not letting landlords in if entries are not urgent, et cetera, case by case. I understand, but that's part of exercising your right to find out if you fall in that category. You're welcome. How much time is allowed to make uh, repairs after uh, an initial SCAP inspection? I would say the minimum amount of time is about 37 days, but sometimes due to holidays and circumstances in this pandemic, it's been a lot longer. With proper notices and uh, I don't know what's meant by reasonable accommodations, um, the, you know, um, but proper notices, people can be evicted for denying access if they're unreasonable. Some of the landlords that the inspector asked the landlord to fix, but they are a tenant's fault. Can we charge the tenant? Things like hole in the door, not reporting mildew in the bathroom due to fan working. Those are simple issues and we don't advise you. That's something that because you run a business, you have to contact an attorney or someone legal expert to get answers to those questions. Okay. Okay, this is my contact information. I hope no one's calling me right now because my phone's ringing. Um, so I'll leave this up and let me see how I can get the chat. See chat. Okay, there's the chat. Does anyone have any more questions? Okay, I'm gonna leave up the, this up a couple more minutes. I think we have an inspector on this on this case. Ever, are you still there? Can we un unmute Ever? I am. Yes, I am. Okay, um, this is Inspector Gerardo. Uh, he, he recently transferred out of the complaints units and he, I worked with him for several years. Ever on the um, paddle fan, the question, is it 36 or 30 inches for the smoke detector? Do you know off the top of your head? It's 36 inches. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for the confirmation. You're um, welcome. Did, all right. Um, I think we're going to go ahead. I'm going to stop this share right now for the screen and I'm going to check on chat real quick. And if there's no more um, questions, then I think we're, we're done. Laura, are you still there? I'm here. I think we're done. I don't see any more um, questions in the chat. I just want to say thank you to everybody. Um, if there's something like next week you think of, oh, I wish I'd asked them to go ahead and call me or email me, and uh, I will get back to you for sure. And if I can't answer your question or it has to go somewhere else, then I'll find somebody that can answer it for you. Okay. All right. Well, I'm going to go ahead and uh, we're going to go ahead and end the meeting now. And I, I just wish the best to all of you and take care. Bye bye.